Well, welcome to Marshview Ministries Online. I am glad that you're with us this morning, and it's my hope and it's my prayer that you can experience the blessing of worshiping the Lord. And as we hear from His Word today, that you would be richly blessed by that as well. If you haven't noticed, the setting around me is a little bit different this week, and the reason for that is I'm doing this from my home uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, last week uh, I had a the great pleasure of breaking my ankle and uh, so I'm wearing a boot my mobility is kind of cut back and uh, the second reason is is that it is uh, Thursday and it is snowing out quite a bit so instead of trying to maneuver outside on additional snow and ice which was the cause of the break in the first place I uh, decided to take the equipment home and to record from my house so that's the first announcement and I um, hope that this all goes well. The second announcement is that this is Communion Sunday as well. And so uh, we'll be doing Communion at the end of the service today. So if you would like to pause the video after this introduction and go and get um, some elements, some juice and some bread for Communion, that you could do that now. And then at the end of the service, we'll be able to take it uh, Communion all together. Uh, communion again is not for perfect people it is for those who seek God's grace and God's forgiveness and uh, desire to have him as the Lord of their life and so uh, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you're welcome to take communion with us this morning the other thing is I'd just like to open us up then with a uh, call to worship call to worship is from Psalm 47 and there it says, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. Clap your hands, all you nation. In other words, rejoice. Uh, acknowledge he, that God is great, He is majestic, and He is Lord over all the earth. And is this God who desires to be in communion with us, and he did that by demonstrating his great love for us by sending his son to die on the cross so that we could have life with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of your word. And what that word does is it stirs within us a sense of your presence and a, and a sense of um, that relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, that as we commune together today as we worship together today as we hear your word together today that you will be praised and that you will be glorified and magnified through our praise uh, but lord also we might have that assurance of your relationship with us and lord we thank you for your grace which is powerful and mighty to save we pray these things in jesus name amen I invite you to raise your hands this morning and receive a blessing from the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the wonderful, the powerful, and the mighty working of His Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this week I'd like us to turn back to the book of Joshua again. Now, in the book of Joshua, we have been going through... Um, a series of stories in Joshua 1 through 5 so far about God bringing the people of Israel right up to that promised land and the the things that are happening just as they're about ready to enter into that promised land are really significant. They're significant points of, of learning the history of the Jewish nation and, and how they formed uh, as a nation in this promised land. Um, we get to see the devotion that they had in that um, journey towards that promised land. We get to see how God works in and through his people as well. And the story of redemption that comes through in these chapters in the book of Joshua. And um, we can learn from these some of the principles, some of the things that God would have us be able to apply into our own life as well. Now, last week we ended up canceling the in-person service because of a snowstorm. And um, the, you know, the unfortunate part is, is that I hate canceling 
church because I, I really regretted it because I, I really wanted to give last week's message in person because I think as the week developed on and as I engage with a, a congregation, a face-to-face rather than on a tape, there's something about that dynamic that really helps the message come alive. And so I, I regretted doing it, but I live out in the country and the snow drifts had formed in my driveway and on the road that we lead into town, um, it's not plowed very often. And so it wasn't until about 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday that we actually got plowed out. Um, but I hate canceling the services and, and, and I regret doing that. Um, and I feel guilty about doing that, but because of those situations, it, it happened. And then it was later on that day that I was out cleaning up my own driveway, plowing and shoveling, and uh, it was there that I slipped on the ice and I broke my leg, broke my ankle. And um, as I'm thinking about that, uh, you know, one of those strange thoughts that comes to your head is that, oh, maybe God is punishing me uh, because of canceling the church service. Now, I know that's not very reasonable, and as I shared that with some other people along the way, they said, you know, that's, that's just kind of foolish thinking. But, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. When things don't go our way, sometimes that is the thought that comes to our mind first. Maybe God is punishing us. And, you know, I think a lot of times we grow up in church and, and we hear messages of God's punishment. We hear God about God's uh, wrath and, and it forms in us um, an identity about who God is and, our, and his relationship with us. And, and some of us grew up with the idea of a, an angry God, a vindictive God, maybe even a barbaric kind of God. And, and this view can really cause some problems with our relationship with God. For, for some people, we they find God to be this punishing God, and it kind of gives them some ammunition that says, you know, if that's the kind of God that God is, well, why should I serve him if he's an angry, vindictive God? And, um, but on the other side of that coin as well, uh, people may not see God as a punishing God, they may reject that whole idea and say, well, God is just a God of mercy and grace, and God is a forgiving God, and and there's really nothing that we can do that would warrant punishment. And, And that's the other side of a coin that's also a distorted view of God. And so I hope as we work through Um, these passages in Joshua, and particularly as we come into Joshua chapter 6, I I don't want us to fall into some kind of a stereotype of God, because in the scriptures we see a full range of the character, the nature of God, who God is. And God is a just, and he's a holy, and he's a righteous God, which does punish evil. But God is also a God of mercy and grace and he's long suffering and and he doesn't wish to punish people and that's the other side and that's more of a complete picture of who God is and for those who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior we we can understand God as this God who is forgiving and merciful and gracious so as we get into chapter 6 I said I don't want us to fall into some sort of stereotypical view of uh, who God is and and a distorted view of who God is because I think as we look particularly in chapter 6 we could fall into that trap and I hope in our studies of Joshua that we're going to see something that clears up some of these stereotypical views of who God is. Now with that in mind I want us to just to take a couple of minutes to review uh, last week's message because we had just gone in Joshua chapter 5, the first part of it, uh, the people of Israel had crossed over the Jordan River. The, the, The banks of the Jordan River, the water flowed back together, and so they were kind of trapped between the Jordan River and the city of Jericho and the armies of the nations that lived in the land of Canaan. And uh, it was it was a tremendous miracle that God did. He stopped the waters of the Jordan River. They crossed uh, hundreds of thousands of people crossed over that dry 
riverbed into the land of Canaan. And you would have thought that that would have been the most opportune time for the people of Israel to strike, to, to go into battle with the people of Canaan because they were hyped up. I mean, they just saw God do a remarkable uh, miracle of stopping the water. And the people, it says, in Jericho were frightened. They were paralyzed by um, what they just witnessed, that God stopping that Jordan River and allowing the people to come over. And it would have been a perfect time for God to say, okay, take control of the land. Just go ahead and do it. But instead, we found out last week that God stops them, and he stops them for a period of time, and he, and he tells Joshua, he says, I want you to do two things. I want you to circumcise all the males um, of, of Israel because I want to reestablish, to reaffirm a covenant that I made with their forefathers, uh, Abraham, years ago, that I would be their God and they will be my people. So. Joshua circumcises all of the males, um, and and that incapacitates them for a period of time as they're healing. The other thing that God has them do is, is do um, the celebration of the Passover. Now, the Passover was, again, a, another ceremony. It was another celebration of, of God's faithfulness of bringing the people out of the land of Egypt after he had sent the 10 plagues and how he was a God who was a savior, a redeemer, a rescuer from their slavery. And so these two Old Testament sacraments, in a sense, um, are performed just as they come over that Jordan River and before they engage in the battles before them. And I thought about that, and it was, and why did God have them do that? Because God wanted to affirm to them the importance of his relationship, his covenantal relationship with his people. And that's important because so often I think for ourselves too, it's like when God gives us opportunity, we, we feel like we need to do something. We feel like we need to, to uh, in a sense, approve our commitment to him and to do something for him and i think that is part of faith you know in the uh, book of james it says uh, faith without works is dead so god does call us to do something but the unfortunate part is is that sometimes we can do things and we find our merit we find our relationship in just the doing part and i had a, a mentor uh, years ago, his name was Jim Osterhaus, and, and his advice to me, his words to me was, being before doing. Being before doing. In instance, being in relationship with God before doing things for God. Because if we're not in being with him, then we're doing things on our own power, we're doing things on our own abilities, we're doing things on our own agenda, and we're attributing it to God. But when we're in being with him, then we have this right perspective. We, we can hear from God. We know what God wants us to do. And the most important thing God wants for us is that relationship. And that's exactly that is exactly what God was telling the people of Israel as they came into that promised land. He says, being before doing. I want to secure this relationship with you to know that this is the most important thing before you do anything for me in this land. And so that really sets us up now for this uh, passage that we're going to be look at at the end of Joshua chapter 5, um, starting at verse... Uh, 13 and it says this when Joshua was near the town of Jericho he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in hand and Joshua went up to him and demanded are you friend or foe neither one he replied I am the commander of the Lord's army at this Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence I am at your command Joshua said what do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals. 
For the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Now, these few verses here give a picture to one of the most unique encounters in all of the scriptures. So, get the scene. So Joshua is out and he is scouting out the city. It seems like, according to the wording here, he is right at the walls of the, J, uh, the, uh, the city of Jericho. He is right at the walls and he's doing reconnaissance work. He's spying it out for himself so that before they attack, he kind of knows the layout of the land. And as he's in this close proximity, he sees someone wielding a sword. And this encounter points to us to believe that this is a divine being. Now, theologians have a name for this. It's called a, a theophany, or sometimes, in some cases, it's called a Christophany. And what that means is that Joshua encounters here an Old Testament. He has an Old Testament encounter with the third person, uh, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus Christ himself, a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. So before the he's born as a baby in the New Testament and the uh, author of salvation through that, we see pictures, glimpses in the Old Testament of, of this Christophany, this, this presentation of Christ himself. And, and it can be in either a, a human form or some angelic being. Now, some scholars believe that this encounter with Joshua was an angel, uh, like Michael or Gabriel, and, and that's why he identifies himself as a commander of the Lord's army, as a warrior that's ready for a battle. And I understand that because a passage doesn't clearly tell us that this was God himself or um, the second person of the Trinity of Christ, because in this Old Testament, that revelation hadn't come yet. But other scholars have considered this to be a Christophany, a, um, a, a demonstration of Christ himself in a pre-incarnate form. Um, in other Old Testament encounters, we'll see Christ in some way shows himself, like in Genesis chapter 17, um, he's present there with Abram. In Genesis 32, Jacob uh, is wrestling with God, and, and that's a theophany. Uh, Gideon in the book of Judges, and probably is the one who in the book of Daniels appears as the Son of God um, in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are Christophanies. Those are visible manifestations of, of Christ before his incarnation in the New Testament. And, and there's a couple of things in this encounter that kind of uh, lend itself to that understanding. One is, is that when Joshua encounters him, um, he bows down in reverence, it says, in reverence to him. And anytime there is a, an encounter with an angel, and, and I'm sure those are overpowering uh, encounters and, and people bow down, an angel does not receive the, the adoration, the worship, or the, the veneration of that person that reverence, they have him stand up, but here there isn't any call for them to stand up because he's an angel. Uh, the second thing is that we see is that Joshua is commanded to take off his sandals because the land that he is standing on is holy ground. Again, these are kind of the words that, that come to Moses when Moses encounters God at the uh, burning bush at the call of his ministry. Remember to take off your sandals for the ground that you are standing on is holy ground. Now, God had told Joshua along the way that he would be with him as he was with uh, Moses. And I think these very words demonstrate again to, to Joshua that God was gonna be with him. And this is a, a vision of Christ here. And the last thing that this visitor that we see is he encounters um, Joshua with a sword. Now, that may not seem to be particularly out of white line because uh, I'm sure Joshua is carrying a sword because they're just about ready to go into battle. And so he encounters somebody with a sword. Uh, but I think about that in light of a couple of pictures of Christ in the book of Revelation. 
In the book of Revelation chapter 1, it says that John had his vision and there was Christ with a sword protruding from his mouth. And again, in, John, in uh, Revelation chapter 19, John sees this vision of, of the, the rider and the horse and he's carrying a sword. And, and those are, are visions of, of um, judgment that is going to be coming on uh, to evil. And this is really what's happening here is that there will be a time of judgment uh, against the people of Canaan. And so with all of that, uh, it, it kind of affirms to me that, that this encounter that Joshua has is with a pre-incarnate Christ. And so with that, um, I want to take a look at a couple of things uh, that will help us, I think, encourage us in our own faith. And the, the first point is this, um, and Joshua kind of relates this, is which side are you on? Now, I think of Joshua in this encounter as kind of a scary dude. I mean, he, he was a, a veteran, I think, in a, some sense of, of difficult times. Um, he had been the commander of the, the armies of Israel, and they had, uh, and, and I think he was seasoned in this sense. And, and here he was. He was a spy before he had gone into the land. He traveled in the desert for 40 years. He again now is the commander of the, of the, uh, um, the, the people of Israel. And I think he was ready to go. And I think Joshua is kind of this scary guy. And when he sees this, or he has this encounter with this, this being, this man, he doesn't hide. He doesn't back away. He goes right towards him and he asked them that question which side are you on see that's not a man of fear that's a man of bravery and he takes a bull by the horns and he wants to know if this person is for them or against them which side are you on um you know this week is is super bowl sunday and um and it's a too, it's too bad that the Packers aren't in the Super Bowl, that they lost um, their, their playoff games there. Because, you know, isn't, isn't God a Packer fan? At least that's what I've always heard around Wisconsin, that, that God must be a Packer fan, um, that God is on the Packers' side. Now, we kind of laugh about that a little bit, and we kind of say that as a, as a joke. Um, but yet, you know, I think that that mindset kind of sneaks into our lives so often, is that, that God is on our side. And, and those words from Joshua, and even though Joshua doesn't know who he's talking to at first, but that question, are you for us or against us? It's kind of the mentality that we place so often towards God. God, are, are you for us or are you against us? And the commander of the Lord's army, it says, gives him a response that Joshua wasn't quite expecting. He says, neither one, for I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now, like Joshua, I believe it's kind of easy to, to see life um, one-dimensional, kind of unilateral. Are you on my side or are you against me? Uh, black and white, for or against, our perspectives are often way too limited. And in this passage, the pre-incarnate Christ says, neither one. And that reminds me that Joshua and us, um, that God sees a bigger picture. That God is powerful and majestic and in control of all things. And he is the one to whom, um, and to whom we decide if we are going to be for God or against God versus the other way around. Um, it's not for us to set the agenda. It's not for us to ask, to set our agenda and then to ask God, are you for us or are you against us? Now, I know our first reaction would be to say, well, of course, you know, God is in control and, and we're to follow him. But the reality is, is that we are all tempted to set the agenda for our life, to have our plans, to go our own way, and, and then ask, God to bless it and say, God, here's my plans, here's my agenda, this is what I want to do, and so God be with me. God bless me. God do this for me. 
And, and sometimes we even fall into prayers like that where we set the agenda and then we ask for God's blessing on our agenda. You know, I think one of the things that, that often turns people off towards God is this very fact, is that there are times when, when we fall into that trap of, of setting our agenda and then asking God to bless that agenda. And then when it doesn't turn out, when things don't go the way that we plan, we get frustrated with God, we get angry with God, we get hurt by God, and and we think to ourselves, well, um, if this is all that I get out of this relationship, well then, God must be against me. Now just recently I read through the book of Job, and, and even though um, the book of Job really doesn't say that, uh, I think there are times when Job's attitude is close to that. Um, where he's arguing, kind of pleading his case before God. And, and he says, you know, God, why are you against me? Why are you shooting these arrows against me? Why, why is this happening to me? It'd be better if I had never been born. Why did you curse me with being born? David struggled in the Psalms with that when there was things that were not going well and, and David would look at life and, and he would question, is God against me? Is God for me? And in Job, in, in Job and in the Psalms and here in Joshua, we're reminded that, that God has a bigger picture that's going on. And there might be times when it seems like God is against us, but really in the long term, in the big picture, we have to believe, we have to remember that if we're a child of God, God even takes those difficult times, those, those hard times, those times when don't go our way, where we're really frustrated and, and, and wondering if God really cares for us, but God says, hang on, I, I got a bigger picture happening here. I am really there and I care. And I want you to remember to be for me because I got you. And, and that really leads us into the next point that Christ is the true leader. Now I'm sure Joshua had a lot on his mind, right? Uh, he had some big shoes to fall, to fill in, taking over Moses' spot and, and here the people of Israel are facing a challenge that, that Moses had never faced. I mean, they're going to go up against fortified cities in armies of these nations. There were going to be battles before them as they conquer the land. And Joshua is the leader of the nation. And I believe that this appearance reminds Joshua that he is not the commander. Jesus is. It isn't that, that God tells Joshua what to do and then walks away. Um, but that God is not only with Joshua, but that Christ is really the true head. He is the true leader. Joshua is just like the, the lieutenant of the army, while Christ is the general. And God's got this. And Joshua is to understand his role as a servant, his role uh, to be submissive to the will of God and not to be the leader. I wonder if that took a lot of the weight off of Joshua's shoulders, this encounter, uh, to know that, that God was really in control and not just um, a passive part of it. And it was up to Joshua to do the work, but that God was really in control. And there was armies, armies of God to help in this battle, to help in this struggle. And I wonder how many of us carry the battle and the burdens of what we face thinking, you know, we've got all the responsibility. We've got to take control. We've got to fix this. We have to make the decisions. We have to do everything. And I wonder if this passage itself would help us to be able to relinquish some of that control, some of that burden, some of that worry, when things in life seem to be insurmountable, 
um, barriers that are bigger for us, mountains that we can't climb, those kind of obstacles before us that God says, I've got this. Just follow me. Trust me. Submit to me because I am the true leader. It's a great reminder. And the last part is that in Christ's presence, we stand on holy ground. Joshua realizes who this individual is that's before him, and he submits to Christ and says in verse 14, it says, I am your, I am at your command, Joshua said, what do you want your servant to do? Here Christ presents himself as a warrior, right? We see him in the New Testament as a savior, and here we see him as a warrior, ready to do battle against evil, and Joshua is probably ready to get into the battle plans, and he says, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to tell my men? What do you want me to prepare for? And you would think that the typical army, uh, the typical response would be it was to get ready for the battle, right? To get ready for the battle. But Jesus says in verse 15, he says, The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And Joshua did as he was told. Wow. Wow. Just, just think about that for a moment. Remove your shoes because where you are standing is holy ground. What are you facing? Let me ask this question. What are you facing in your life right now? What battles, what trials, what complications, what obstacles again? Have you felt that you have to be in control? Have you struggled with letting God into certain areas of your life? Have you felt uh, a sense of independence from Him? Or, or maybe even some distance from God along the way? And maybe you're struggling and thinking that, you know, God's against me. Maybe you're kind of there in your spiritual life, in your relationship with God right now. And this last verse, I think, is really powerful. It's a reminder of me to have an attitude that I need to embrace. Where, where I stand in the presence of God and I'm standing on, on holy ground in my life. As a believer of, of Christ, we um, understand that Christ is with us always. And wherever we are at, wherever we are in a position in our life, no matter where we are, we're in the presence of Christ, we are on holy ground. See, that last verse is a powerful reminder of me of the attitude that I need to embrace. That where I'm at, wherever I'm at. I'm in holy ground. Because where's Joshua? He's not in holy ground. He's on the enemy's ground, right? At least that would be what he thinks. I'm on the enemy territory. And God says, you know what? Wherever you are at, with my presence, you are on holy ground. Now, as we come to the communion table today, it's a reminder to us that it's Christ's presence is always with us. Christ himself says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Lo, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. Remember that. Remember that. And I want us to consider that as we come to the table today. Because like Jesus, we, we like Joshua, we make our approach to Jesus. We, we come to the table and we got to ask ourselves, what goes through our mind as we come to the table? Do we think this is in the back of our mind? Do we think, is Jesus for me or is Jesus against me? Are we insecure in our relationship with Christ? Do we think, is Jesus for me or against me? Or do we think, Jesus, I am your servant. What do you want me to do? Or, or do you come first with a heart that understands that as we approach the table, as we come to the communion table, that we are standing on holy ground? Now, people, 
wherever we are, whether we are at the communion table in the sanctuary or we're at our home right now and we're about ready to take communion together, do you realize that, that you are on holy ground? Do you realize and do you consider that, that his presence is both um, with us in the forms of the bread and the juice as, as a reminder of this holy presence of Christ, but he is truly present with us in his spirit as he indwells within us. And he affirms us the idea that he is Lord, that he is a warrior, that he has fought the battle for us and he has won for our salvation. And that is how we respond then to Christ. I am your servant. What do you want me to do? And we're a servant not because he just wants us to do things, but we're his servant because he has established that relationship with us by his death and by his resurrection. And I hope that what we take away from this passage this morning is that in communion, we need to have a deep reverence towards Christ and that we are not to take the sacrament lightly, but with a deep sense of awe, wonder, and reverence for the warrior Christ who won that victory of death and sin and hell. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you have given to us, all that you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of grace. And we ask your blessing now in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, I want to invite you to take your elements for communion. And I want us to, to come to the table with a sense of awe and reverence. Then the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a cup, or he took a, a loaf of bread and he broke it and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took a cup of wine and he passed it to his disciples. And he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the complete forgiveness of all of your sins. And he invites us to this table to eat, to drink, to remember, and to believe that the precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was broken and shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Again, let's close in prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace. Help us to live in that grace. Help us to, to live in the reverence and the awe and the wonder of who you are. That we stand on holy ground in your presence. May that give us confidence and assurance to live fully for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Enjoy some worship time. Maybe next week we'll be back in the church setting.